Okay, g'day all, welcome to another video. Uh, today I want to talk about uh, C++ bit fields. So in C++ we usually create integer variables which are 8, 16, 32 or 64 bits wide. Uh, but sometimes it might be nice to make a variable that's got say 3 bits or 5 bits. And that's exactly what a bit field lets us do. It lets us create integer variables with pretty much any number of bits. Uh, up to and including 64 bits. So the sad thing is that bit fields are not completely standardized and there's a lot of aspects about bit fields that have to do with the compiler uh, implementation and also the system that you're working on. So big endian versus little endian, um, just like unions. All right, here's the syntax. So the syntax is really, really simple. So you define bit fields as member variables of structures and classes. Um, here's the syntax down here. So we've got the data type, say character or short or int or even long, long. Um, then we've got the variable name, a in this case, then we follow that with a colon and then the number of bits that we want. So it's this colon and the three that makes this a bit field. And down here, I've got some unsigned uh, bit fields. Um, we've got a bit field called B, which is two bits wide. We've got a bit field called C, which is five bits wide. And we've got another bit field called D, which is one bit wide. Yeah, so you've got signed or unsigned bit fields, and you can use lots of different data types. So characters, shorts, ints, or long longs. Alrighty, but this is what it actually does. So this is how the uh, Microsoft compiler works. Um, for this particular structure up here, if we were to make an instance of this structure in RAM, this is what the RAM would look like. Um, the compiler would allocate two bytes of RAM and it would do that because, wait a minute. Okay, <laughs> this is actually not the first take and I fiddled with it before. What, we'd, what we would end up with is uh, the A bit field being the first three bits of an assigned character and then five bits of padding would be added and then an unsigned character bit field would be used to store all of these other three bit fields. So you can see really that other than this um, unused bits over here, uh, bit fields really pack data very, very tightly together. So we've got four variables here, A, B, C and D, and they're packed together in two bytes. The reason that we've used two bytes here instead of just packing all of the data together in one is really compiler specific, but what the Microsoft compiler does is every time you change from signed to unsigned, um, it's going to use another byte. Yeah, so if this if this second bit field down here was um, char as well, um, well this B variable could be packed into the first byte, so we would get um, that. Uh, but the C variable can't be packed. It would actually overflow that first byte. So then we would get um, a second byte would be allocated. Uh, this would be a char up here. And we'd have, what's that? One, two, three, four, five, six. We'd have two more bits on the end like that. Yeah, that's how it would look if they were both char. So the Microsoft compiler packs things as closely together as it can. Uh, but it always jumps to the next, say, character or short integer whenever you change from signed to unsigned. Yeah, pretty cool though. So this is really the point of bit fields. It's to pack data into um, yeah, a small amount of memory. Yeah. Okay, but we talked about packing just then. We had a bit of a look at an example. That's actually Microsoft specific. And the GNU compiler does basically the same thing uh, with regards to packing bit fields. But but the thing is, it's not standardized and there's no reason that a compiler author couldn't write their compiler to use a separate character for each of those bit fields. Um, it's not portable either. I mean, you can't assume that this packing here is going to be used for this structure uh, on any system and with any compiler. So, yeah, that's just a, a description of how Microsoft's uh, compiler works and the GNU compiler. Okay, but onto the data type. So the data type affects the maximum size of the bit field and it also affects the padding. But uh, if we come over here to a bit of Visual Studio. So this is a Microsoft compiler, obviously it's Visual Studio. If we make ourselves a bit field, I might just call it a bit field. Um, an eight bit character, so say unsigned uh, char A, 
an 8-bit character can't hold a 9-bit uh, bit field. So this this doesn't really make any sense, and the compiler is going to tell us about it. Where is it? Where is it? Here we go. Look at that. Type of bit field too small for number of bits. There you go. So you'd have to change that to a short in order to store an, uh, a 9-bit uh, bit field. And a short couldn't hold 17. Um, a short integer's only got 16 bits, so uh, again, the compiler would complain. If you're using the GNU compiler, it doesn't... Uh, you can do this, you can do this, uh, you can do this if you like, and the GNU compiler will give you a warning, it'll say, you know, what are you, what are you doing here, bro? Uh, 9 bits doesn't fit into an 8-bit character, but um, along with the warning, it'll also uh, upgrade that to a short, so it'll yeah, just try and figure out what you meant. Uh, but the Microsoft compiler just won't compile. Okay, so but aside from setting the um, the maximum number of bits you can use for a bit field, um, the data type also affects the padding. So if we come back here uh, to the next slide, this is exactly the same structure as before, except uh, instead of characters, I've used short integers. And we can see now that there's a lot more padding. So the A variable will be placed in the first three bits of this signed short just here. But then the next bit fields are unsigned shorts. So the compiler, the Microsoft compiler, is not going to jam them into this, you know, signed short down here. It's going to jump over to the next short boundary. So there's a short boundary every 16 bits. Uh, it's going to jump up to the next uh, boundary and it's going to store the um, B, C and D variables there uh, with a whole bunch of unused bits at the top as well. Um, so you can see that the data type um, character or short or, or, or int or long long affects the amount of padding. Uh, if we had something like this, right, so if they were both short, then we could actually just fit them all into this first one just here. And I think the compiler would do something like this. Yeah, we would just put them there. Well, well, we've got a bunch of blue ones in the way, but, but I think you get my point. Yeah, if we had, if they were both short, you know, if we didn't change from signed to unsigned, then the compiler could fit them all into a single short. Could fit all of our bit fields into a single short. Okay. Alrighty, so the data type affects the maximum size of the bit field that we're allowed, and it also affects the padding. Good stuff. Okay, here's another trick. So we saw just before um, the Microsoft compiler and the GNU compiler do the same thing. Whenever you change from signed to unsigned, they'll jump to the next boundary, up to the next you know boundary of the data type. So sometimes you might want to do that yourself. You know, you might want to force the compiler to jump to the next boundary, and you can do that with this special symbol here. This um, well, it's a it's a bit field with no name and it's got a length of zero. So without this line just here, if I just get rid of this line, um, there we go. So without the line, we have just two little character bit fields, signed character bit fields, A and B, each of three bits. This is what that's going to look like in RAM. Yeah, so the whole thing would be less than a character. We'd have two unused bits at the end. Uh, but the A and B variables would be packed as closely together as possible. Yeah, so that's without the uh, little next boundary trick. Uh, if we put in this little trick here to jump to the next boundary, this is what we get. The A variable will be packed into the bottom three bits of a character, but then because of this uh, boundary symbol just here, jump to the next boundary symbol, the B variable will start on its own character. And this might be useful. I mean, it's wasteful of space. We're wasting, um, what, 10 bits of data here. Yeah, we're taking up two characters for our structure instead of taking up one and wasting two bits of data. Uh, but it might be useful because the A variable just here and the B variable both fall on addressable characters. Yeah. Usually you can't take the address. We'll have a look in just a second. Usually you can't take the address of a bit field, but you know, you could use a union or, or something like that, and you could actually, in this instance, take the address of both the A or the B variable. So this little trick might be useful, even though it, uh, it's not so conservative of RAM. Okay, so the operators that we can use, as far as I can tell, you can use any operator. So if we've got something like this, A3, I might change this to... Uh, Maybe unsigned, well not unsigned, unsigned, unsigned char. And we've got another one called B. 
Uh, you can use pretty much any operator you like. So if we define one of these, uh, bit field, and we'll call it BF for bit field, or best friend, <laughs> either way. Uh, BF.A equals 2, and we could say BF.B equals 3. So if we wanted to multiply them together, you would just do normal integer arithmetic. Uh, B. Easy as that. Uh, or you could add them together, you get 5. Uh, you could subtract one from the other. Uh, these are unsigned, so that's probably going to wrap around. Uh, which really brings up the next point. Um, aside from all of the operators, so we've also got shifting operators. You know, you can shift left and right, or you can do Boolean operators as well. So uh, we could say bf.a equals bf or bf... Uh, bfa equals uh, b or a. Yeah, something like that. You've got all your Boolean operators. But what I wanted to say was A only has three bits. Um, a only has three bits. So so three bits, if if A was um, seven, uh, then A looks like that in RAM. And what happens if we go like that? What happens? Well, uh, it's compiler specific. Which is really, really sad. So the Microsoft compiler is sensible about this and the GNU compiler is sensible about this as well. What will happen with these two compilers, they're good compilers, you know, a lot of, a lot of kind of high grade compilers will do the same thing. Um, they'll just wrap A round to zero. So you'll get that. Yeah, but the reason why you might not get that is because in RAM, what this looks like, this bit field just here looks something like, um, that's the B value and beside it is the A value. Now it's not defined in the C++ standard what happens when you increment a bit field outside of its range. So what the compiler author might do, because it's faster, what they might do is um, just add. They might just add, which would end up with um, that. 7 plus 1 gives you 8 in binary. And what's happened here is that we've overflowed our A value into our B value. Yeah, but the the... Microsoft compiler doesn't do that. The GNU compiler doesn't do that. I haven't got it, but I bet the Intel doesn't. Intel compiler doesn't do that too. Um, we can test if it does that. So int and bf.b and all. If we print out the b value, we'll get zero just here. No, sorry, we get one. <laughs> That's a terrible demonstration. Um, we got to set the b value first. Yeah, so the one was just in the B value automatically. That's not, it's not a good example. Oh, there you go, zero, yeah, zero. So the A value hasn't wrapped around and affected the B value, uh, but it could. Yeah, it could, depending on the compiler that you're using, it could. Alrighty, so the operators. Yeah, you got pretty much all of the operators, um, and on a good compiler, you can fairly safely use any integer operation that you like. Good stuff. Uh, the range, alrighty, so the range is, uh, for unsigned integers, the range is 2 to the power n minus 1, where n is the number of bits in the field. So for 13 bits, you'd have a range of 0 to 2 to the power 13 minus 1, which gives you 0 to 8191. Uh, or you could have a 5-bit field, which would give you 0 to 31, etc, etc, etc. Yeah, so that's the unsigned range. That's the range that you'll get whenever you use an unsigned um, data type here. So unsigned char, unsigned short, unsigned int, or unsigned long long. And the signed range, well, um, we're using two's complement. So the signed range is from negative two to the power of n minus one up to positive two to the power of n minus one minus one. Uh, so a 5-bit signed uh, bit field would have a range from negative 2 to the power 4 all the way up to 2 to the power 4 minus 1, which would give you negative 16 to 15. Uh, or another example, a 12-bit signed field would have a range from negative 2048 up to 2047. Uh, they use 2's complement. Yeah, I don't want to go into what 2's complement is, but that's what they use to represent signed values. Uh, also, it's it's worth mentioning again, really, it's it's compiler specific. I mean, what happens when you go outside of those range ranges for a bit field? It's it's up to the compiler. 
Um, okay, so moving along, we spoke a little bit about addresses before. Uh, let's just let's just go through that. So so basically, long story short, you can't take the address of a bit field. Now, so if we've got ourselves a bit field, um, A and B are our bit fields. Uh, it doesn't. Uh, the compiler won't let us take the address if we do something like that. No, you just you can't you can't do it. Let's see what it says. Uh, taking the <laughs> taking the address of a bit field is not allowed. <laughs> That's good. I didn't want to do it anyway. But the, the the reason why it does this is because the A just here actually has the same address as BF. So so whatever BF's address is, that's where A is. Uh, there you go. It's at fief. <laughs> it's at a hundred fief. Uh, but the B value just here isn't. It doesn't have a, a byte address. It's halfway through a byte. So its address is whatever the address of that is plus 0.5. Um, and on x86 computers and pretty much all of the modern computers, you know, even embedded systems, you can't you can't address halfway through a byte. You know, byte is the smallest addressable value. Uh, so for that reason, you can't take the address of a bit field. Good stuff. Um, okay, so here's a bit of an example. I think we finish up with three little examples on how you might use bit fields. So this is a, a really common example. Say you've got a collection of flags, right? So you've got yourself a structure. You call it capital flags. Um, it might be a bunch of bools, so A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, is that 8? 1, 2, 3, 4, yeah, that's 8. Uh, these could stand for anything, so they're just Boolean values. It could be whether it's daytime or, or whether it's um, nighttime, we probably wouldn't have that. Uh, whether the user's got a mono monitor, uh, whether the zombie apocalypse has begun, you know, whatever, whatever you want, but it's just yes or no. Okay, so each of these is yes or no, 0 or 1. Uh, but what's uh, what's quite sad? What's quite sad? If I just get rid of that, is uh, is this? Well, what's quite sad is this. Let's have a look. Look at that. Eight. The size of this structure just here is eight bytes wide, and that mightn't sound like very much, but that's 64 bits. 64 bits of RAM are used to allocate these little little bulls just here. These are only yes or no. You know, they're only one bit each. And there's only eight of them. So why in the world would you need 64 bits of RAM? Well, I tell you what, <laughs> we're clever C++ programmers and we know about bit fields. So uh, what we can do is uh, instead of using um, just bool, we could use ourselves a bit field um, we might make it unsigned char. Uh, a is one bit, B is one bit. C you'd never guess is one bit because D is one bit, E is one bit, but F is one bit, and oh, G is one bit, and H is two bits. <laughs> I'm kidding, one bit. Now we've got exactly the same thing as before, except we're using a bit field so that each of these is only one bit wide. Would you look at that? We've gone from needing eight bytes of storage for our structure to needing one byte of storage for our structure. Now that's pretty conservative on RAM. That's really what bit fields are good for. So if you're sending a lot of data over a network or something, um, this is just a much better way to send it. I mean, one byte versus eight bytes, it's, it's very, very good. Or if you're using an embedded system, uh, you haven't you haven't got a lot of RAM, maybe? Um, this is a good way to store a bunch of flags. Yeah, store them as bits instead of um, instead of bytes. The other thing that I wanted to say, this is this is a trick actually. So we looked at unions last time. Um, well we'll just make one of these first of all. So uh, we'll just make our flags variable. I might just call it F for flag. And we can set it like this. So we could say A equals true if you want. Uh, or F A equals zero, so you can use zero for false um, and one for true. It doesn't really matter. Um, you could say F dot uh, B equals F dot C. Whatever the B flag is, we can, um, or whatever the C flag is, we can set that to the to the B flag. Uh, it's pretty convenient, really. So we can even we can even toggle things. So we could say something like F G equals uh, not F G. So that would toggle the G flag. Yeah, if it's true, it'll become false. If it's false, it'll become true. 
all of these little tricks are really good. You could do this with um, the, the Boolean flags that we had before, but something else really cool that you can do with a um, union is, uh, is this. Uh, let me get this right. Hold on a second. Have I... Ah, there we go. Look at that. Look at that. Okay, so all I did just then was I unioned our bit fields, our eight little bit fields, with an unsigned character called all. And this is really cool because what it lets us do is not only manipulate the bits, you know, individually, setting each to true or false, uh, or toggling them or whatever, but if we ever need to really quickly set all of the bits at once to zero, for example, this will do it. This is set all eight flags to false. In a single, you know, fell swoop, all flags will become false. If you want to set them all to true, uh, you would do this and negative one, you know, because negative one is nothing but ones in uh, in binary, so in two's complement. So that uh, would set all the flags to true. Okay, so using this little trick here, unioning uh, an unsigned character to these eight flags, these eight bit field flags, um, we actually end up with um, a really fast way to set and unset all of the flags at once if we need to, plus we've got the flexibility of using them one at a time. It's a really good way to save a lot of memory. Yeah, a lot of memory and uh, we've still got speed, we've got flexibility. Good stuff. Uh, here's another example. I, I don't know why I've even put this in here, but um, if you're making a card game, um, you might think about storing your cards in a structure something like this. I'll just copy it over here so that we can zoom in. Um, Alright, so the suit is any one of five values, and the spot value is any one of, what, 14 values. The most natural way to do this is probably just to store them as characters, so something like this, and then we'll have down here unsigned char um, spot value. Yeah, so your suit would be one character, your spot value would be another, but the thing about that is it takes up two bytes of RAM, and the suit, if the suit is one of five values, then you actually only need three bits to store that. And if the spot value is any one of 14 values, then you actually only need four bits to store that. Which means that we can use um, a bit field to store our cards and actually use one character instead of using two. Yeah, so that would be an example of a, a little card thing there in case you feel like making a card game. Good stuff. Another example really of just how, you know, how good uh, bit fields are for conserving space. This is this is half the amount of space this cards uh, this card structure takes compared to the version with uh, without using bit fields. Okay, and the final example. This is really good fun. This is a bit of a uh, bit of bit twiddling, I triple E style. Um, let me just copy this over here and have some fun. Okay, so here I've got myself a structure called F thirty two. And it's a bit field that allows us to manipulate the uh, parts of an IEEE floating point number. So floats, as you may or may not know, use a, a format called IEEE 754. And in that format, there's a bunch of different sections. So there's a 23-bit mantissa, there's an 8-bit exponent, and there's also a 1-bit sign. So if we union a bit field with our mantissa exponent and sign to a float, then what we end up with is quite cool. We end up with, um, well, I might make one first, F32, uh, I'll just call it F, and we might set it to 25 point, or just 25 will do. Okay, so now we've got F value, which is just 25. I might just see out that uh, f dot f value, the floating point value. So that'll just give us 25. Should do anyway. Okay, that's given us 25. But we've also got, because of our bit fields, we've got access to the individual components of the uh, float. So what we might, what we might want to do is uh, flip the sign bit, for example. So if you flip the sign bit of a float, you uh, you turn it negative. Let's flip it and see what happens. What we should get is negative 25. Would you look at that? <laughs> negative 25. This is faster 
this is faster than um, than multiplying it by negative uh, one. So if we said something like um, f, you know, f value times equals negative one, um, the compiler might actually use slower instructions. So this could be quicker. Uh, it might not be too. I mean, computers nowadays are pretty fast at multiplication. Uh, but the other things that I want to show you, this is this is quite cool as well. So the exponent, if you add to the exponent, so f dot uh, exponent plus plus, if you add one to the exponent, you'll double the uh, value. So we get 50. Yeah, there you go, 50. Again, that's faster than multiplying this number by 2.0, floating point. Uh, if you want to halve it, then you can just subtract one from the exponent. Yeah, there you go. 12.5. I don't know. Uh, some some compilers might be clever enough to know that if you have something like um, uh, something like this, uh, the compiler might actually be clever enough to know that it can just decrement the exponent. Yeah, but that would be compiler specific. Yeah, all good. All right. So what else have we got? Um, yeah. So you can you can do lots of lots and lots of d different little tricks. So if you want to multiply by two to the power n, then all you've got to do is add n to the exponent. Or if you want to divide your floating point value by n, uh, two to the power n, then you just um, subtract n from your exponent. Uh, you can flip the sign if you want. You can set your float to nan. Yeah, nan is um, all ones in the exponent. So setting your exponent to negative one will result in your floating point, this f value just here, being nan, not a number. Um, you can even set the sign. It's pretty weird. In IEEE, they've got um, nan, not a number, and then they've also got negative nan. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, IEEE. That makes tons of sense. Um, we've also got... Uh, the sign here. So if you want to set to infinity, then uh, that's negative one for your exponent, but something else in your mantissa? No. I don't know what I've done here, but the um, if, if you want infinity, then you want um, an exponent of negative one and nothing in your mantissa. And if you want nan, then you need your mantissa to be filled up with ones. Yeah, I hope that makes a bit of sense. I don't know if it's true either. Let's have a bit of a look. So if we go um, f dot exponent equals negative one, and f dot uh, mantissa equals negative one. So that should be um, nan, I think. Let's have a look. Yeah, there you go. Q nan they call it. So if you've got anything other than um, all ones in your mantissa, so if your mantissa is zero then um, you'll get um, infinity. Yeah, there you go, infinity. And if your sign bit is 1 and your exponent is negative 1 and your mantissa is 0, then you'll get negative infinity. Let's have a look. Ah, there you go. All right, anyway. Uh, anyway, some floating point bit hacks. Whew. Okay, well... Um, we're just about done. So in the end, all I want to say is that I think that bit fields are a really good idea, but they're, they're implementation specific and they suffer from the same kind of portability problems as unions. Yeah, so we didn't really talk about it, but endianness matters a lot <laughs> uh, for bit fields, just like it did for unions. And what it comes down to in the end is if you allocate a bit field greater than the data type, then the compiler can do whatever it wants. If you overflow or underflow the data type, the compiler can do whatever it wants. Uh, the packing orders up to the compiler and you start to wonder, is there anything actually not up to the compiler? I mean, <laughs> is anything actually safe with bit fields? And, uh, and, and there are, you know, things that you can do that are safe with bit fields. If you're, if you're confident that you know how your compiler works, so you're using, say, the Microsoft compiler uh, or the GNU compiler, uh, and you're confident that you know how your system works, you know, whether it's Big Endian or Little Endian, something like x86 is, uh, is pretty easy. There's a lot of documentation out there. It's Little Endian. Um, if you're confident with those things, then you can save massive, massive amounts of, uh, of, of RAM using bit fields. I mean, we turned, we turned eight flags from uh, eight bytes all the way down to one byte. And it was easy to do with bit fields. Anyway, I personally don't use bit fields very often, and, and you know, frankly, nobody does because of this uh, compatibility issues. Uh, but they're really, really cool. They're very, very cool. 
Uh, have a really good day and thanks for watching. See you later.